Here's actually a really interesting thing about migraine. If you look at from a burden of disease perspective, migraine primarily affects people in their prime working years. So what you're doing is taking out a big chunk of your workforce and putting them on disability. So the you know if you if you look at the numbers around uh, our government actually taking this health issue seriously and addressing it, it's a no-brainer. Migraine is an invisible illness. It's not merely a bad headache, but a debilitating experience that is not well understood. Today around my warm table, we're speaking with Brenda Moore, who's battled migraines for decades and has researched the illness thoroughly. She also served on the Migraine Australia Board to help others navigate their pathway. And she is a productivity consultant, finding clever strategies and efficient solutions to ensure best results. It's a fitting career for someone who strives to make every moment count and create an optimal environment to help businesses shine. Although Brenda tells us her preference is to dim the lights as she's working from home to keep the migraines at bay. I'm Sonia Nolan and welcome to My Warm Table. Well, there are lots of reasons why I wanted to catch up with you, Brenda. Of course, you know, we've been um, friends since, gosh, I think we were six years old when we first met <laughs> back in primary school and have watched a journey of, um, of life happen for us both um, in and out of contact, I guess, <laughs> over many years. But now very happy to be back in contact and so much that I can learn from you and one of the things that I really wanted to talk about today was migraine mm -hmm. because I know that's something that is a, a very common part of, of life for many people and I'd love to get a deeper understanding of it and I thought you'd be the perfect person to help us. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm always happy to try to um, inform people whenever I can because migraine is very, very poorly understood as a disorder. There's a common misconception that migraine is a bad headache. Yes. And you'll hear a lot of people use the words headache and migraine interchangeably. That perception has not helped the treatment and management of, for people who, who live with migraine. Migraine is actually a complex genetic neurological disorder Um where essentially you have a very highly sensitive nervous system and any system in your body going out of whack can trigger an attack. Some people are sensitive to one thing and somebody else, will, will that thing will not bother them at all, but other things will set them off. So you'll hear people talk about they have a range of migraine triggers. For some people it's citrus, for some people it's caffeine chocolate, cheese, food triggers often, yes. yeah. stress is a trigger, mm. um, some people can't tolerate smells, it's a whole range of, but basically anything sensory can set the brain into this sort of fight or flight response where it starts firing off all these pain receptors and basically, you know, telling that person, the person with the migraine to get the hell out of there yeah, wherever you are. Go somewhere safe. Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, most people that you meet with migraine will talk about episodic migraine. This is this is your co-worker who maybe once every six months or so needs to take a day off because they've had a migraine attack. Um, but for some people, the condition becomes chronic. So um, episodic, just going back, is just it happens every now and then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you'll just have an occasional attack. It's, okay. Um, if you think of it like a spectrum sort of mm. disorder and then the frequency and severity of symptoms varies along that and that varies for individuals across their life as well depending on what's going on yeah right. um so for some people the condition becomes chronic the term chronic is not necessarily the best way to describe it but it's also the shorthand that people are familiar with yes certainly in migraine australia who i was associated have been associated with they promote the use of um, effectively managed or, or you know poorly managed or whatever. Mm. Um, but when you're in this when you're in this chronic state, this poorly managed state, you may find that you're having symptoms daily, and the only variation is severity. Technically, the the definition as a diagnosis is more than fifteen symptom days a month. But again, not a helpful diagnostic and criteria. That's for chronic, is yeah, it? yeah. Right. That's how a doctor will say okay. you have more chronic than fifteen migraine. symptom days a, a month. month. Gosh, that would just mean that you're sick every second day. Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> um, right. 
and I guess we, we're talking now because in the last 18 months or so I've started coming back into the workforce. And I actually had uh, about three years where I was completely unable to work because I was spending maybe 70% of my time shutting my bedroom with the lights off and wow. just unable to leave the house. Yes. Um, and that obviously you can imagine there's a whole lot of mental health and physical health stuff that comes along with that and it becomes this really sort of vicious cycle. I was lucky enough, I shall call it some lifestyle changes, I broke up with my partner. <laughs> okay, that is a lifestyle change, right. Um, and that, that turned out to be a very positive lifestyle change mm-hmm. and things, things started to improve. And then I also started trialling uh, medicinal cannabis as oh, a treatment okay. yep. and I've actually found that is really good as well. So, What does that help you with? There are painkillers that actually act on the physical sensation of pain and there are painkillers that act on your emotional response to the pain and both of them are really important into how you actually experience Mm. the pain. So the cannabis acts on your emotional response. So I still have the pain uh, but I just don't care about it so much. Um, And so, and by the way, when I say I don't care about it, I don't mean that I'm stoned on this (laughs) stuff. It's it's quite a low dose. (laughs) But um, I do feel remarkably chilled, yeah, let's right. just say. Okay. And so that's medicinal medicinal cannabis. Yeah, yeah. And then what other um, what other treatments have you had? So I have been having anti-CGRP medications, which are some of the, the quite new ones that are coming mm. out. Um, so you might have heard about them in the news. So, sorry, can you just explain what is CRGP? What does that stand okay, for? Okay, so CGRP. <laughs> or CGRP. Yeah. Stands for calcitonin gene related peptide. Okay. Um, so that's a new type of It's a of very new thing. Treatment. It's actually sort of the first class of medications to come to market that have been specifically developed to treat migraine based on new research that they're starting to understand the neurological things that are going on with migraine. Up until this point, everything that's been prescribed for migraine has been prescribed off, off brand. Shelf, Basically, yeah. they um, anecdotally found that a medication for blood pressure or you know, whatever, has positive effect on migraine for some people. <laughs> right, okay. So it's sort of been almost like a byproduct of something else. You literally, has been yeah. like, okay, well, that'll, that'll be okay to treat some migraine sufferers. And so if you're fortunate enough to get a diagnosis mm. and a referral to a neurologist, um, that's a whole other rabbit hole of issues there. Yeah. And I was fortunate. I very quickly got under the care of a neurologist. But essentially what the neurologist does is then you systematically work through this show bag list mm. <laughs> of of medications and see what works and then you combine them and see if that makes any difference Um, and the other fun thing that happens in this is that uh, quite often you'll become tolerant to a medication Uh and so while it worked initially the effect wears off. So coming back to the CGRP I was already in this kind of I'd, I'd pretty much tried everything in the show bag by the time the CGRPs became available so I got onto the drug company trial um, so that's not the clinical trial. It's already been approved. But then the drug companies do a thing where they need to demonstrate that there's a market. Right. Um, and that's part of them taking that application to the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Uh, to actually have it yeah. subsidised in yes, some way. Yes. Right. So I got into this trial where I was basically supplied this medication for free for 18 months, two years anyway. And it was very, worked quite well for me initially. And is it a is it a tablet? Oh, is it, like, no, this is um, is this is when you go into hospital to have your no, treatment? No, no, that's, that's a different, different thing. again. Oh, I want to talk about that one in okay. a moment too. But describe so, to me what this one is. So this one is a once a month injection. So you okay. get it in an auto injector, like an EpiPen. Mm-hmm. You just whack yep. it in your thigh and yes. off you go. I would certainly notice it tailing off toward the end. What sort of symptoms would you start to have again? to know that it's tailing off? Uh, More frequent attacks, basically. For me, it's quite common to have some level of symptom nearly every day. And so that might just be, uh, the common ones for me are light sensitivity and sound sensitivity. So I have the most insane collection of sunglasses and hats (sighs) you have ever seen in your life. And that's to protect you from the sun. That is to protect me from the sun but also because I'm me it matches my outfit (laughs) I was gonna say that you know you you do you may as well rock the sunglasses if you're gonna have to wear them hey that's what I think Mm. absolutely and so for a person who suffers migraine attacks they would would they normally be 
a patient of a neurologist or do most people just sort of suffer through this and, and talk to their yeah, GP about so, it? so again, and that's about it being a poorly understood condition. Mm. Doctors, generally speaking in their medical training, don't get a lot of uh, information on migraine. It does depend on you having a GP who's taken an interest in the subject or is willing to take an interest in the subject. So there's been little education of the doctors, but there's also been little to educate the doctors with up yes. until very recently. So, mm. you know, even the ones who know a lot about migraine, well, the medical community didn't know a lot about migraine. So they, you know, they only knew what was there. So so that's that's turning in terms of the research assisting but that's still a problem within the medical community is that they don't a doctor doesn't receive a lot of education on the nature of it and it's such a complex disorder as you were saying yes so a lot of people will go in i guess the first line is you you will treat the symptoms if the if you know if the attacks are infrequent it's it's all about symptom management mm. but a lot of people will go in and it won't be diagnosed as migraine. Mm -hmm. It won't be identified as migraine. Um, certainly people with some of the um, more severe presentations, the, the chronic conditions. So there's there's one called hemiplegic migraine, which really affects your balance and your speech and um, people look like they're drunk. Right. Some people just can't walk when this happens. Vestibular migraine gives you vertigo. And so there's multiple presentations. And then there's... Um, colloquially called a silent migraine which is a migraine with no pain so oh. you might have all of the other symptoms all of the other neurological sensitivities but you're not experiencing a painful headache and so doctors will not think to check that that has been caused by migraine. So right. there's there's all these things that look like other things and yeah. get misdiagnosed. And there's also something called an abdominal migraine as yeah, well. Yeah, so that's very common with children. Yes. Um, and, yeah, basically presents a severe stomach pain. Mm. Yeah, so there's, there's so many ways that it can present. So it, it becomes misdiagnosed and maybe, you know, you and your doctor feel that you're managing it quite effectively, but by not having been referred to a specialist, you may be not getting the optimal treatment. Or the options of treatment. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So there might be something out there that can completely turn your life around, but you haven't, you know, you haven't delved into it because, no, because you don't your know doctor what you doesn't don't know, know it exists. Yeah, no, I understand. You also mentioned once to me, Brenda, that migraine seems to be predominantly a female issue. Yes, I just, when I was talking about the misdiagnosis, I thought about the same thing. Women outnumber men with migraine, I think by five to one. Don't, five to one. Don't quote me on that, but it's mm. something like that. Some element of theory talks about the fact that the hormones are obviously involved because mm -hmm. that's one of the systems that can get out of balance and it's very, very common for women to report that they'll get a migraine just before their period or when they're ovulating or, you know, it can be very, very cyclical for some people. Historically then, that has led to migraine being looked at as a women's disorder mm. and we all know how well that's worked out for women in history because women's pain is not perceived as being as real or as legitimate as, as men's pain. Women's health conditions are written off as being hormones and something that you just have to live with. Oh, so whole, many reasons. The whole hysteria. Yes, history, hysteria. Mm. Yes. Mm. I listened to this hilarious podcast called The Dollop and they um, there's two comedians and they talk about stories out of history and they were talking about how when bicycles first became popular, there was a massive panic that women's uteruses were going to fly out because they were moving so fast on these bicycles. Wow, imagine you know, that. Thank <laughs> God we had people looking out for us, right? <laughs> Oh, gosh, there's so much more to learn, but it does sound like there are some inroads in regards to understanding more about migraine attacks. So yeah. So that's really positive. So tell me about the other treatment that you have, Brenda. Mm. Oh, so... that's yeah. fairly new too and a little bit radical. Yeah, so the first time we tried to set this uh, podcast up, I was in hospital at the yeah. time and we, we were going to try and record in the hospital, but then we decided that might not be a no. great environment for it. Um, but and it's I just... think that's, that's actually an interesting history about us trying to get together to do this <laughs> podcast that has been sort of migraine influenced in yes. some respect. This is, I just, nowadays when I meet a new person, when I 
get involved in a professional or personal capacity with anyone, I'm really quick to say, look, I just need to let you know this. I have this condition and it means I cancel a lot. Yes. Um, And please don't take it personally. It's not you, it's me. (laughs) And it's not that you're unprofessional. It's that you have a chronic health issue. Yeah. 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 That's right. And Mm. and I, I guess... That hasn't always gone hand in hand in language that, oh, I've got a migraine, oh, I've got a chronic health issue. I, I think people just say, oh, gosh, she's, you know, she's got that bad headache. Yeah. And she's, scamp- she's hung over. And she's hung over. <laughs> and she's just going to, you know, scamper off work. And, and yes. you know, so, so sadly it comes with a lot of that sort of attachment yeah. as well, doesn't and it? And I resisted that for a long time because I also had to go through all this stuff in my head about, bringing this into my identity Mm. because I've always been hardworking and ambitious and if I, you know, if I hit a tough time at work, my solution would usually be, well, I just have to put in some extra hours for the next few months and I'll get on top of it and then it'll all be cool. And now that strategy not only doesn't work, it just makes things worse. It's counterproductive for you. But no, look, and, and, you know, because we've known each other a long time, Brenda, Mm. and I knew you before migraine. Yeah, you know, I know the hardworking, intelligent, incredibly capable woman that mm. you are and have been all along. So it yeah. must have been a very difficult yeah, so time for getting, your identity. To, getting that realisation yeah. that, oh, no, I can't just power through this one yeah. is is really hard. And to, to think of myself as a person with a disability and, mm. and all of these things. And so, yeah, it was a long time coming, but I really just think, you know what, the best thing is just to say, I'm going to tell you this. Yes. This is going to affect my behaviour in a way that's probably not typical of everybody that you meet and this is why it is. And so far so good. That's working well. You know, it's never received. I've never had that received poorly by anyone. So, Well, I think it's because you've put yourself out there and, you know, sort of laid it out front pretty quickly. Yeah. So I think that that's a really, you know, clever strategy but also, mm. you know, completely authentic to the type of business that you yeah, want to Yeah, well, I think, yeah, and the type of business that I want to do, it is really important that, that my clients understand that about me because, yes, I've got migraine, by the way, um, does give you some superpowers. Turns out oh. you're a really good systemic thinker. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. tell me more about that. So mostly I do business process improvement or project management or setting up new initiatives. And my background to date has been in the health and community services space. What that amounts to, I guess, is that I'll come into a business, um, spend a lot of time talking to different people and the people who do the jobs and hearing about their experiences. But one of my strengths and that's led me to love this work is that I'm very, very quick to spot the interrelationships and see the interconnections between things. And that, it turns out, is a common characteristic among people who have migraine. Let's step back a bit because we were starting to talk about their treatment that you have in hospital. So tell me about that. So my neurologist is Dr. Andrew Kelly who works out of Nexus Neurology in Murdoch and this is a protocol that he orders. So I don't know, I'm sure other neurologists have their own things that they do. The one that I have dr kelly which the people at the hospital just call it dr kelly's cocktail (laughs) Um, but it's i think it's magnesium vitamin b anti-inflammatories anti-convulsants anti-nausea they put these on an infusion pump and i will stay in hospital for three to seven days having this treatment as in constantly being pumped yeah yeah Yeah. well i mean you'll get sort of an hour or two break in between but um Actually, it's funny, the um, last two times I've been in, uh, they gave me what is called a PICC line, which I can't remember what it stands for, but basically they, instead of giving you an IV in your arm, because I have horrible teeny tiny veins mm. and it, it, they would basically have to do a new a new cannula every single time so they gave me this pick line which uh, goes straight into one of the chambers of your heart so they use ultrasound to put it into place uh-huh. um, yeah and you just yeah you basically get this little um, just like a little bung in yeah. your arm that they can connect the IVs to um, anyway that's great because now I come out of the hospital and I don't look like I've just gone six rounds with yeah. Mike Tyson so <laughs> so that's good so yes yeah, so I'll spend three to seven days in the hospital depending on what's going on in my life and why I've asked I usually do that once or twice a year and the effect for me is it just resets mm. the light bulb moment for me is if I notice that I'm taking 
painkillers every single day. Mm-hmm. If I'm needing, like, if I'm needing two tramadols a day for a period of however long, mm. I need to go in and have this treatment done because it just resets, resets my brain, takes it out of that agitated state. I'll usually be pain free while I'm in the hospital having the treatment, and I'll get a period of good pain relief after that. And then the frequency and severity of the symptoms will build up again over a period of six to 12 months. Right. And then I ring Dr. Kelly and say, I need to go in again. And Can I have another cocktail? Yes, off we go. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. But at least you've got something that you can manage yes. it with. And you're very aware of your symptoms. So can you describe for me what it feels like to have a migraine attack? And, and I, I'm sure it's very different in everybody. Yeah. But can you describe for me what it's like for you, so Brenda? So in... In my case, um, and you're right, everyone's is a little bit different, four phases of a migraine attack. We have prodrome, which is a period of symptoms leading up to the attack, and sometimes that can be quite recognisable and sometimes it's not. Then you have aura, which is, you know, where people will tell you that they have visual disturbance, that's an aura. Then you have the attack itself, and then you have the postrome which um, is also known as a migraine hangover, colloquially. Mm. You'll usually have a period of time where you just, you basically just feel hungover, you're just wiped out. So prodrome for me usually is feeling very, very tired. Like if I wake up one day and I feel like I've got a massive flu coming on and I've just been hit by a truck and I'm, or aches and pains, that's maybe, that can be a good indicator for me that, that there's an attack on the way. Um, interesting thing that they're saying about that now is when you look at how food triggers and people talk about that they crave chocolate before they have a migraine, there's now some theory going on about is that something happening in that in that prodrome phase that with your body chemistry made you crave a particular food and you ate the food, but then that's not actually what triggered the migraine because the migraine had already started. Ah, oh, I see. So anyway. Right, um, okay, so they're looking at looking into that. Yeah. So then if I get an aura, I usually see like spots or sparkles in my vision and I have tingling, mostly in my face, sometimes in my body. First ever migraine attack I had, I ended up in the emergency room because I thought I was having a stroke because the left side of my body was tingling from head to toe. Okay. <laughs> And, and how old were you at that time? I uh, would have been about 30, early 30s, yeah. Okay, all right. So early 30s, your very first sign of migraine mm-hmm. and you actually thought you were having a stroke rather yep. than knowing what it was. Yeah. And you were very early diagnosed and yes. at that moment they said, this, this is, is a migraine. migraine. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So you were really, you were one of the lucky I ones. I was lucky, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the aura for me is visual disturbance and tingling. I'll also, this is about the time when I'll start being very light sensitive. That might have actually started in the prodrome as well. That can be something that I notice that indicates that I've got an attack coming is if I feel very uh, light sensitive and also if I feel very nauseous. Mm. Um, Light sensitivity and nausea are linked for me. Like I will, I'll get up one morning and I think I'm fine and I'll walk out the door and feel like I want to vomit because... Oh, because the no, light still light sensitive. Yeah. Okay, then we go into the attack. I do have the pounding headache. And again, nausea, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity. I get something called allod- allodynia, which is being sensitive to touch. So, and which was really, really hard when the kids were little because, oh, you yes. know, when what does the five year old want to do when mummy's sick is come and give her a of big course. cuddle? And I'm just like, <laughs> Kids are all skin, over you at the best of times. Yeah, it would yeah. make my skin crawl. It was oh, horrible. Oh, and how sad for you. Because, I know. Yeah. I know because mm. I'm such a bum. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Um, so I get that. Sometimes I will get uh, vertigo. Mm. Um, sometimes I will get tinnitus. Very Depends. Yeah. Bit of a potluck. Yeah. The, um, so the headache um, and a classic migraine headache is made worse by movement. Mm. So... I don't do anything. So usually what I do is just to take some strong painkillers and sleep it off. However, when you have them frequently, that really messes with your sleep cycle. And one of the biggest triggers for me is disrupted sleep. Mm. So that's another juggling act of resting enough to get through the pain versus not being awake all night the next night. (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, So usually what I would try to do then in all but the most severe pain is I'll 
sit in my room, which is the darkest room in the house because I've made it very migraine friendly, and I'll listen to a podcast or an audiobook. So that's to keep me distracted and occupied. And then I'll play like Candy Crush or something on my right, iPad. Something mindless. So that I don't fall asleep right. listening to my audio. And that, but does the Candy Crush mess with the visual, the eyes? It doesn't the... for me. A lot of people can't can't watch a screen yeah when they're when they're during an attack and that doesn't bother me so much but like if I watch a movie or something I won't take it all in but mm. if I listen to an audiobook I do take a lot of it in mm. um I don't know maybe it, yeah. yeah that's just my brain yeah, right. and I have um so <laughs> I've got this thing I do where I try to make it at least a little bit productive and so quite often my audiobook will be something business related and then I keep a notebook by the bed and if I think of anything brilliant for the business I write it down and Fantastic. come back later. Well this is why you are a productivity expert because you can actually find opportunities <laughs> to be productive when you're in a migraine attack. Um, I love being called a productivity expert and I always tell people what that actually means is I'm a really lazy person. <laughs> I don't want to think too much about this. I'd like it to happen with zero input from me. So that's what I like in my home and that's what I like in my work. <laughs> so let's find a system that's actually going to make that happen. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, what happens then is I don't use that time that I save by being lazy to be lazy. I go on to the next project and do something else. See, there you go. You're counterproductive, <laughs> Brenda. <laughs> So that's what the attack looks like for you. Yes. And I remember you saying to me what your personal best was once in regards to how long one of those attacks went for. Was it 18 days? Oh, something like that, yeah. Wow. That sounds about right. That's a long time to, to be in full attack mode. Mm. And is that fairly common for people who suffer from chronic migraine? It's hard to say because it's so, it's so variable. When my condition first became out of control like that, I did what I always do, was which I go out and start researching because I like to understand things that, um, I don't know, that just helps me make sense of the world. It's just what I do. So I quickly found myself in migraine chat groups on Facebook, which are fantastic, really good source of support. I got connected with Migraine Australia um, and I started talking to a lot of people who had the condition. So when it first happened for me, I'd never heard of this happening to anybody before. So I'm like, you know, what? what is this? What is this? Yeah. What's wrong with me? But then when I became involved with the support groups, I realised there's actually there are a lot of people out there in that and I, I can't tell you the figures but certainly a big community um, of, of people who are living with daily symptoms um, some of whom you know much more severe than what I've explained lots of people uh, out of work here's actually a really interesting thing about migraine if you look at um, from a burden of disease perspective mm. migraine primarily affects people in their prime working years so what you're doing is taking out a big chunk of your workforce and putting them on disability. Yeah, so right. the, you know, if you if you look at the numbers around uh, our government actually taking this health issue seriously and addressing it, it's a no-brainer. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds. It makes sense. Look, I've I've got some. All I've got here are some US numbers mm -hmm. from an um, an article which I happened to stumble across the other day, and apparently this this says migraine headaches currently affect more than one billion people across the globe. Yeah, and are the second leading cause of disability worldwide. Yep. Yes. In the US, like I said, these US numbers, nearly one quarter of US households have at least one member who suffers from migraines. Mm -hmm. An estimated 85.6 million workdays are lost as a result of migraine headaches each year. Yep. Well, they've used the words migraine headaches, but yeah. I know that it's migraine attack. Yes. So right. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> so anyone who's interested in knowing more about migraine, please go to the Migraine Australia website. That's www.migraine.org.au. Um, they're a fantastic volunteer-led organisation, up until recently 100% volunteer, um, but they were fortunate enough to get some funding and been able to put, I think, a staff member on. But they are sort of the peak body in Australia for representation for people with migraine. So it's a, it's a patient-led organisation. Um, so there's another group... Uh, 
Migraine and Headache Australia, who are part of the Brain Foundation, and they're the sort of medical peak body. Right, so run by doctors more yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Whereas uh, Migraine, Migraine Australia is run by the run by the patients, run and by it's the people. Lived experience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. So they produced a fabulous resource, a uh, migraine language guide, which uh, I'd encourage people to have a look at. One of the issues, as we talked earlier about getting diagnosed and getting proper treatment, is this misperception that migraine is uh, is code for a bad headache. Mm. Um, and so we use language that supports the misperception. A more effective way of communicating is to think that mig- migraine is a disease. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about migraine, we are talking about the disease and that is lifelong, incurable, neurological, it's always with you all the time. But if you have migraine disease, then you might have migraine attacks, which is when your symptoms flare up. So Brenda, tell me about how you have through necessity but also through choice yeah reinvented your life knowing that you are a migraine sufferer and that that is something that is with you for life unless a magical cure is discovered (laughs) um you've actually redefined yourself professionally Mm -hmm. and re-established yourself as a small business owner working in this field of productivity through happen consulting Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that journey I stopped work about three years ago and I was fortunate enough to have some insurance. So after that initial tough period of arguing with the insurance company to get them to approve it, I was okay financially. And I I said I was really fortunate, not everybody's in that position. I'd had a fantastically supportive boss in my work with St John Ambulance. But honestly, I'd probably stayed at work maybe three years longer than I should have because I'd had my performance had just been declining. So I had this amazing boss, did everything for me to keep me in there. Um, But ultimately it got to a point where I was barely making it to work half a day a week. Because you were just always having attacks. Yeah. 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 So, okay, I'll pull the pin. I can't do this anymore. And, you know, I I was really depressed for a while. Yeah. You know, it was very, very hard. And this is when I was talking about all the stuff about my identity and and who am I and is this what the rest of my life is going to look like. And maybe, I don't know, 18 months, two years of that. And I had this light bulb moment and for the life of me, I cannot remember where it came from. But I had this moment where I'm like, well, you know, you can sit here and feel sorry for yourself or... You can accept the reality that this might be what the rest of your life looks like and make it better yes. <laughs> so you can feel good about yourself, <laughs> not to just be, you know, uplifting and inspiring. There was also, there's a five-year limit on my insurance, so I needed a plan for what was going to happen next. Next. Mm. Um because, you know, I've got a big mortgage. <laughs> well, you, and you want to be productive. I mean, you know, you just want to keep, yes. keep doing what well, you're doing. When you're we talk, too young for Yeah, and we talked about that sort of professional and identity. Yeah. That's so much a part of me. So the mm. idea that I wasn't working and contributing and all of those things um, was really hard for me. So I toyed around with this idea of consulting for a long time. It's actually always something I wanted to do because I really enjoy project-based work. Um, have a bit of a low threshold for boredom so it's really nice to be moving on to something new all the time and so I'd always thought I'd love to be a consultant but I never felt I had the financial stability to take the risk so I had to turn this around I'm like well I know I've got an income for five years that's actually a massive opportunity. This, you know, this is the opportunity I've been waiting for to be financially to secure, this to is set time. up on my own. Yeah. Um, you know the uh, expression, you're only as good as your last gig? Mm. My last gig was not my best gig. <laughs> <laughs> so I really sort of got my head into, I had to get into strategy mode and sort of reestablish my networks, rebrand myself, reestablish trust. Of course. And I decided and... And also, you know, build build a brand. and But it was always a long game. I knew this was going to be a process. So I just st- started doing the social media. I got myself a website and, yeah, just started blogging and writing and being active in the small business community and in the various professional networks that I want to be a part of. Um, volunteer work with Migraine Australia. Now I volunteer as the chapter lead for the Australian Organisation for Quality. Mm -hmm. Um, peak body for quality management professionals. Yeah, so I got involved with a lot of volunteer projects to start to get me working 
professionally and get my self confidence back. Yes. And uh, yeah, get get the confidence of others back, or you know, meet new people who are confident in my abilities. And so that's been, I think, eighteen months in now, and um, I'm starting to get uh, well. I certainly have a lot of communication and really strong networks. I am beginning to book paid work off the back of those efforts um, and certainly, you know, the referral network's uh, booming and so it, it's starting to translate into results and I'm really happy with that and I'm booking the kind of work that I want and the size of jobs that I want because this was really important, I guess, in thinking about who my who my audience was. Who out there do I want to know who I am and what I do? Yes. Um, so I'm very much targeting small to medium business. In what sort of sector? Uh, mainly health and community services, mm -hmm. um, but also through my involvement with the Australian Organisation for Quality, I end up in a lot of engineering and resourcey type stuff as well. Yeah. So um, that's fine. I grew up in Rockingham. I can speak the language. I was going to say, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, oh, so that sounds like it's going well, Brenda. Yeah. And, and you've given yourself, you know, you're patient with yourself in building it as well because you've got that buffer, which is fantastic. Well, and again, another mental head shift, I guess, that I had to make was... Whatever I accomplish on a day is enough. I can't set myself brutal deadlines and, you know, I can't commit to large amounts of work because I don't know where that's going to go. So, yeah, it needs, needs to be small and snappy and, you know, lean, lean into my strengths. <laughs> yeah, good for you. What would you like people to know about migraine? Sort of three top things that as we leave and round up the podcast, mm -hmm. three things you want people listening to uh, understand about migraine if they know someone who's got a migraine or mm -hmm. perhaps they have got migraines mm -hmm. themselves, migraine attacks. I'm going to try and get my positive yep. language going here Good. if they have <laughs> the disease migraine and suffer from migraine attacks. Mm -hmm. What should people know? What do you want people to know to help destigmatize this? Okay, the most important thing to know is that it's more than just a headache. Yes. There's so much more going on. Something that you can do personally to help address that stigma is not to use the term migraine for anything else other than actual migraine. Don't say that you're so stressed out you're getting a migraine or that this is giving me a migraine. Well, what do you mean is you're getting a bad headache? Yes. I guess be compassionate and understanding about the very individualised nature of migraine. Many, many very well-intentioned uh, people will tell you about their auntie who had migraine and started taking a particular supplement and it cured it or somebody who had a particular therapy and it completely cured it and I certainly understand that that comes from a well-intentioned place but remember that the person that you are talking to has lived with, likely lived with this condition for a very very long time and that can feel insulting to be suggested that you haven't spent your in whole entire life trying to manage this horrible condition of course no absolutely mm. yeah a bit of sensitivity yeah mm. and if people have got migraine attacks and they are currently seeing a gp mm -hmm. who clearly doing the best they can can they ask for a referral to a neurologist can they can uh they you can certainly that? yes Yes, you can do that. Um, also, feel free to shop for GPs. One project that I know was in the works at Migraine Australia, and I can't tell you if it's been completed or not, but they were working on a, a directory of migraine-friendly GPs and neurologists because even neurologists, mm. they're not all migraine experts. So if, if and when that resource is available, that will be a great place to get directed to someone who's going to have a good understanding of the condition. That's fantastic. Brenda, thank you so much for sharing your lived experience of <laughs> migraine attacks. I'm so delighted that you have been able to find the silver linings and, and make it work for you. And, and the fact that you're able to do something that you've you know often dreamed about doing, running your own consultancy and doing mm. it in your own time and with the projects that you're more passionate about, that's actually a really positive outcome for something that you know at one point was, was really debilitating for you. So yeah. I wish you good health. Thank I wish you, you migraine attack friendly free time and um, I'm so delighted to be able to reconnect with you today. Oh, thank you, Sonia. It's been lovely. Had a really nice time. You've been listening to My Warm Table with Sonia Nolan. 
In Italian, a tavola calda is a warm and welcoming table where you can share big ideas, friendship, laughter and life. So much happens around the kitchen table and I wanted to amplify it here in this podcast. My aim is to feed your mind and soul through smart conversations with heart. No topic is off limits, but good table manners rule. I hope you'll join us each week as we set the table for my extraordinary guests who will let you feast on their deep knowledge, life experiences and wise insights. Let's keep the conversation flowing. Please subscribe to the My Warm Table podcast and share it with your friends and networks. Perhaps if they're new to podcasting, take a moment to show them how to download and subscribe so they don't miss an episode either. I'd also love you to join our community on Facebook. You'll find the group at My Warm Table Podcast. Your support is very much appreciated so that together we can eat, think and be merry.